Welcome to the Houston Public Library's series entitled Deliberative Critical Conversations. I'm Larry Payne, your moderator for this program. This day, our subject matter is hate and the implications for our work in racial and social justice. My very special guest speaker is Marjorie Joseph, who is the executive director of the Houston Coalition Against Hate. After Ms. Joseph's presentation, she will in turn introduce our participants and speakers for this evening. This will be followed by a robust panel discussion among the panelists and myself as moderator. We're so glad that you're able to join us for this presentation. I'll now turn the program over to Ms. Joseph. Thank you, Larry and Houston Public Library for inviting us to be a part of this series of facilitated conversations with you. We are honored to be here. HCAH has been in existence since mid-2017. We are a network of community-based organizations, institutions, and leaders who've come together to reduce hate and encourage belonging. We're committed to addressing all incidents of hate, bias, violence, and discrimination. And our ultimate goal is to be a successful model for the prevention of hate and bias. That being said, we've worked hard to have our website be a resource for our members and the community. We encourage everyone to please go visit HoustonAgainstHate.org. There you'll find our committee initiatives and goals, our statements, community practices, otherwise known as CARE. And you will also be able to see our list of members, 55 plus and strong, a justice statement in lieu of DEI policies, which we encourage and invite organizations and corporations to take the language, use it, make it your own, make it align with your mission, or you can hire us as consultants to take you through that process. You'll also find on the website a schedule of our upcoming bystander intervention trainings, which we co-created with Hollaback and one of our members, OCA Greater Houston. Our remaining trainings are August 19th, and September 18th. They are free and simply require registration through the website so you can receive a secure link to attend. So I'm going to share my screen now. So give me one moment to pull that up for everyone. And I'm going to share some of the highlights from our phase one research. So we just went through the mission here. So we we'll, won't stay here. Want to get to our phase one for you. These are our members that you can also see listed on our website. And uh, our phase one research was funded by the Houston Endowment. So. We are grateful for that. So phase one was led by Dr. Anita Kalunta Crumpton of Texas Southern University. And it studies the true state of hate in Houston area and how it compares regionally, nationally, and what, if anything, local law enforcement agencies could do to better handle and track hate crimes and hate incidents. The findings were gaps in hate crime reporting that make it difficult to accurately track the instances of hate-based violence in Houston and around the country. Submission of data to the FBI, the annual FBI report is voluntary. So many law enforcement agencies elect not to participate. Also hate crimes are defined differently <clears throat> across jurisdictions. So many agencies, including HPD and the FBI, do not track instances of hate that do not rise to the level of a crime. The recommendations, and these are just a few that we're highlighting here this evening, mandatory hate crime tracking and reporting by state and local law enforcement agencies, increased training for both officers and community-based organizations that work directly with targeted populations, 
and increase collaboration between law enforcement and CBOs to support people who experience hate crimes and hate incidents to encourage reporting to authorities. So I'm going to stop screen sharing right now and, and uh, invite, you know, and also share that our research report, the phase one research report is available online. It is available to the public. It can be downloaded from our website. And also the reason why we invited the FBI to join us today in this conversation is because both the FBI and the DOJ have been great partners along with HPD. We've since collaborated with them and our other coalition member ADL on the combating extremism and hate seminar that was offered this year to local law enforcement. So I'm going to bring Marjorie Trace Juge into the conversation so she could share a little bit about what the FBI does and our relationship. Great, thank you so much, MJ. Um, to introduce myself, uh, I'm Marjorie Trace Juge. I'm an intelligence analyst with FBI Houston. It's an honor and a pleasure to be here tonight. And I thank you for the invitation to share how we at FBI State's Phase One Research Report. Um, from an intelligence perspective, when we're analyzing data sets, in order to understand trends on the topics that we address, it's critical that we have a clear understanding of how the data is collected, what the data includes, and what it excludes. Uh, so it's important that we get that data right uh, so that our analysis is accurate and help the field office determine trends in this and to utilize our resources in line with those trends. So Houston Coalition Against Hate's research report has contributed to our understanding of Houston area trends in hate crime and hate incidents. It's given us another perspective on how bias-based crime data and hate crime incidents are reported or not reported. And it highlights areas that we must be aware of when we conduct our analysis. And it highlights intelligence gaps, areas where we lack information surrounding bias-based crime and incident trends. Um, for example, the research report highlights the Uniform Crime Reporting Program, provides us data from participating agencies, but not all agencies. Um, it's a voluntary reporting program because collecting, submitting the data requires monetary resources. Uh, the UC all hate incidents, and as we compare the Houston area to other areas, the Houston Coalition Against Hate Research Report, it reminds us that criteria for reporting can vary by agency. So that's important from an intelligence perspective. And in addition, uh, while understanding trends in hate incidents is important to understanding that overall picture, such incidents are First Amendment protected speech. And we're keenly aware that expressing one's views and in hate incidents is not necessarily a crime by itself. And the FBI does not investigate that conduct. But from an intelligence perspective, aggregated hate incident data from outside agencies and community-based organizations it helps inform us on overall trends um, to the extent that hate incident data is an indicator of activity. So in addition, the, the Houston Coalition Against Hate uh, research report, it illustrates how hate crimes and incidents may go unreported to authorities as victims choose not to report potential hate crime or, or hate incidents, and instead may report hate, uh, those hate crimes and incidents to community-based organizations instead of law enforcement, especially those individuals who are not comfortable contacting law enforcement at any level, um, local, state, or federal. So as a result, the data from community-based organizations, such as the member organizations of uh, Houston Coalition Against Hate, are important to the FBI. Um, so overall, the phase one research report has contributed to our understanding of hate crime trend data 
in the Houston area. So we're definitely appreciated, uh, appreciative of that. Thank you. And now I'd like to invite uh, Professor Abba Brown with the Graduate College of Social Work at the University of Houston to share about our upcoming work with CBOs. Certainly. And thank you so much for having me today. It's truly an honor to be here with you all. Um, so phase, what, we're, what we call phase two of um, the Houston Coalition Against Hate Research Initiative is really um, designed to understand the ways in which community-based organizations currently respond to hate crimes while identifying opportunities to build capacity within community-based organizations and more broadly within our community for community responses to hate crimes. And so part of the, what we are doing is looking at best practices across the country on how communities do respond to hate crimes. You know, the, the interesting, well, I don't know if it's an interesting facet of hate crime, but the intentional facet of the hate crime is that it does not only victimize the individual where the crime was perpetrated against, right? Hate crime by design is meant to intimidate and to um, alarm an entire community of people. And so it's very important that we understand what communities have done in the wake of hate crime to really heal and to help communities move forward. We also want to know what currently community-based organizations do. Um, what's emerging in the research and the interviews that we're doing is really profound. And I think that it speaks to kind of providing a baseline for Houston organizations to know where we are so that we can understand how to build to move forward. And then um, when, when I was approached to do this research and, and the, the team of investigators that I am working with, we only agreed to do the research if we could translate it in real time to the people that we um, were asking to participate in the study. So we intend in, in 2022 to provide a capacity building workshop that translates the findings of what we understand as a result of the research that we've done, as well as provides clear um, direction on how to build infrastructure around capacity both within community-based organizations to respond to hate crime but also between community-based organizations um, in terms of, of community responses. We've been very fortunate to have many different diverse um, community-based organizations all that work either with clients who are likely targets of hate crimes or on issues that tend to propagate hate crime. The three um, top identity markers that really uh, are involved typically with hate crime are race, religion, and sexual orientation. And so those are the areas that we are focusing on. Um, but we're also spending some time really understanding the law enforcement apparatus in Houston from the FBI, Department of Justice, and the Houston Police Department's viewpoints in terms of there's so many resources that are available to really work on hate crimes and support communities that largely communities are unaware of. And so um, we're really trying to kind of illustrate the ecosystem around responding to hate crimes such that um, we're building the capacity of individuals and organizations to be able to do so in a way that's meaningful and healing for those communities that are um, perpetrated against. So we're, we're thrilled to be a part of this. And, you know, I think understanding hate and understanding why this, um, we, we heard from a participant this week that hate crime is a very good indicator of the health of a community. If you begin to see trends upticking in hate crimes and you see especially even more hate incidents, that really tells you a lot about the health of your community. But gathering that data, um, as was, was noted before, is so difficult. And so hopefully through this work, um, we will continue to be able to translate what we're understanding into something that becomes tangible and practical for community-based organizations and individuals to utilize. Thanks, Alba. MJ, anything else on this point? Yeah, no, that's, that's that's you know where we're at with the the work that we're doing and we're we're happy to be here to join in conversation with you well let me see if i can begin now a conversation and, and a dialogue to unpack uh, mm -hmm. all of that it was great thank you all a uh, lot of food for thought there and just those few minutes of sharing mm -hmm. on the reality of hate crime um, 
Let me start with Abba. That, that point you raised about the health of a community can be judged by its hate crimes. Before we talk about where we are going and where we see things going, just give a little snapshot for now. Where are we? What's, what's the state of the health of our community as we speak this evening about hate crimes? Well, you know, I think something that's interesting about the Houston community, I, I wasn't born in Houston, but I celebrated my first birthday here and have lived my entire life in the city and know that over the course of many decades, we have become the most diverse city in the nation. And we often tout that as something that we're very proud of as Houstonians and, and you see it on a lot of um, material about Houston. But I question what that really means, right? Does it mean that we've built a healthy tolerance to just be around one another? Or does it mean that we are actually in relationship or fellowship with one another? And so when I think about the health of a community, I don't only, you know, it, it's almost like, um, it's almost like you when you when you have like tangential symptoms of something, but don't really know that you're sick, right? And so I think that we we have a tendency as people to look at criminal activity. One is something that's very removed from us and that happens to someone else. And while we may feel sympathy for a group that um, a hate crime has occurred, hate crime by nature of of the hate involved in it casts these waves, I think, of anxiety, fear, concern, and hate crime in its motivation is about power and control, and I think fear as well, but is demonstrating um, the intimidation factor, right? Um, it's, it's meant to let people know what they are, what is thought about them. And so I think the, the, how much we allow, how much we tolerate incidents of hate, name calling, abusive behavior, and criminal activity does indicate how, how uniform are we as a city? How, how united are we as a city? How much, frankly, do we have each other's backs? How much do we care about one another? And so while we are this very diverse city, Houston is this perfect crucible to be able to demonstrate to, I think, the nation at large, if we forge real relationships and have real experiences together, perhaps we can be a model for what the nation could be as we move forward into what is inevitably going to be a more diverse United States. Yeah, and I think the changing demographics are playing such an important role in this. Now that we are, as, as you mentioned, a majority minority city in many ways, Dr. Kleinberg always makes the statement that yes, Houston is the most diverse city in America, the fourth largest city, yada, yada, yada. We're also the most segregated city in America. We're the most gated community city in America. Mm -hmm. And the segregation this time is more by economics than it is race, but mm -hmm. it still has the same effect. So mm -hmm. my question to the, the panelists would be this, living in Houston under this banner of diversity and this false sense of diversity in many, many ways and Abba, pointed out, uh, living, working, supporting each other in a world of diversity is not the same as accepting each other in a pluralistic society. And that word tolerance that keeps sneaking back into this, uh, tolerance is such a low bar of, of dealing with another human being. I've always said in Texas, I tolerate the roaches, the ants, the mosquitoes, and the heat. I don't <laughs> want to put a human being on the same level of something I just tolerate. Never going to like, never going to embrace. It's about acceptance. And so this acceptance piece is, um, and even, the, even I know we taught tolerance for a while, it was a discipline, right? wrong discipline. Uh, it's about accepting another human being. And I think until we do that, and, and Dr. Brown touched on that, we need to figure out forums and, and colloquies and workshops that we allow people to come together and talk about that common thing of accepting each other's human beings. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes, I agree with you, Larry, 100%. Um, tolerance is definitely a low bar. Uh, we've always strived for acceptance and our mission is, is belonging, is belonging. And, you know, through the work of the coalition and through collaborative building and, um, having organizations learn about the you know each other's work and co-collaborating with one another in order to build capacity 
has helped people in this city to just connect that way. I mean, Houston has been so segregated that we're finding out that the coalition is now the most diverse coalition in the city of Houston. Houston mm -hmm. has several coalitions, but this is the most diverse coalition mm -hmm. in the city of Houston. And we hear all the time from our members, oh, I've never been in a mosque. Oh my goodness. I, I never got to see, because we don't have a brick and mortar. So all of our meetings pre-pandemic were held at other member organization uh, facilities. And so you would hear, I never knew that your space was like this. I never even learned about the work that you do in the city. So for me also being an outsider like ABBA coming from New York via LA, that was something to get used to. I was excited to come. I heard all of the, we are the most diverse city in the United States and, and it made me excited. And I came because family was here and they encouraged me to come. But I soon quickly realized just how segregated the city was. When I attended a function, I believe it was for uh, the black uh, law enforcement officers, I was in, invited to there and, and it was all black. <laughs> And that was the first time as a New Yorker, I was like, <laughs> where are the Latinos and where are the Asians and what, is, and where are the white people? Like what is happening here? You know, it was really, really deep. So I am all for creating diverse spaces, any way that the co coalition is able to do that. I mean, our focus has always been internal capacity building for our organizations. And we try to fill gaps with the community. When we hear our organizations have gaps that need to be filled, we try to then say, okay, we're gonna fill a gap here. But other than that, we're trying not to reinvent the wheel and we're trying to uplift the work of our members. But I wanna break bread with people. I wanna have, I wanna, I want all kinds of people breaking bread together and having conversations deep conversations about the various intersections that have been marginalized, you know, throughout history. Let me, let me ask Marjorie this question. Uh, since I grew up in Orange, Texas, uh, and lived, uh, literally lived with and, <laughs> and around the first hate group in this country, the Ku Klux Klan, who was alive and real in my life every single day of growing up. And the question I have about that, in today's wonderful world of First Amendment rights and protections, which should be in place, particularly of free speech, which to me has always been the issue of prejudice. You can say anything you want, as long as you do it under the banner of prejudice. But when you move into the area of discrimination and you now act out your prejudice, uh, which is where hate crimes start, what is that fine line today that you have to cross or to move from being just a presidential thing, statement protected by free speech and the First Amendment, and when does it become discrimination? And I ask that because the, the, the laws around this country when it comes to hate crime are so non-uniform. They, they, they go all over, depending which state, which jurisdiction you live in. There ought to be a, a, a one formula or one definition that we can all agree on, on what is, we're moving from prejudice to discrimination, acting out through your hate crime. What does that look like? Well, from an FBI perspective, we have um, you know our federal hate crime laws, and um, you know here uh, at FBI Houston, as an intelligence analyst, I can tell you that that I am uh, pretty far removed from making the determinations that you describe. Um, but I can tell you that. Um, you know, here at the FBI, we work very closely with local law enforcement to, you know, look at um, every incident, every potential crime um, on its, uh, based on, on the evidence that, that is available um, to make the determination of, of hate crime, hate incident, you know, based on those, those federal um, laws. Uh, the you know, again, I, I'm uh, not the best person to describe to you uh, or determine for you, you know, where that line is um, on discrimination versus the criminal act. 
but um, but we're we're guided by this by our statutes. Surely, surely. Let me just mention it before I forget, because I'm a graduate of the FBI Citizens Academy. If you haven't done it, please sign up and do it. Uh, you'll learn a lot. It's very informative uh, about a lot of areas dealing with the FBI and law enforcement, but particularly behind the scenes look at why and how things are done and said the way they are done. Uh, I think that's very important. I might also uh, put the plug in for the uh, Houston Police Department Citizen Academy. Uh, mm -hmm. Many of us have done also another great insight into policing uh, that you normally would not get and understand. Uh, I recently chaired the Mayor's Task Force on Policing Reform, and uh, I learned more than I wanted to know. I learned more than I thought I really knew. Uh, but I want to thank the coalition for their help in the, in the task force report an invaluable tool they were in a lot of the research and data that we used uh, and talked about. And by the way, since I'm on it, before we move on, if you haven't gotten a copy of the task force report, please go to the city of Houston's website uh, and just put in the mayor's task force and police reform. It will all come up. We want everybody to uh, offload an, on, uh, an online copy of it. Uh, you will learn not only about police reform, you will learn about all these issues related to police reform. It's a very complicated issue. Uh, and I, we had a great team of researchers who documented everything, who did great work on the research, uh, best practices across the country, you name it, we included it all. Uh, now we're being asked to share that information with most police departments and cities around the country. Our model is the model uh, for a document for police reform. So let me move to this question, because I think it'll get us to where we are trying to unpack this evening. Is it as much about perspective as, as, as it is reality of how people see others being treated or not treated? In other words, I love the last word in the mission statement of the coalition, to encourage belonging, a sense of belonging. That piece to me seems to be the, the point that resonates. We're such a tribal people. It is my group, my in-group, that's the out-group, my tribe, not your tribe, my people, not your, your people, those people, not them people, others. We still use that language, either intentionally or unintentionally, the thought and the concept and the mindset is there whether one says it or not. It is hard to bridge that gap, to re be outward centered, to be other centric, to begin to understand the plight of uh, each other. Uh, and we've tried hard and Abba knows this through the social work stuff and other things. They were, we've tried to get people to understand other people's plight, to walk in my moccasins, to understand my daily lived experiential reality that may be different from yours, not better, not more, not less, just different. That has been hard work for over 45, 50 years. And it still hasn't resonated the way it should. And I wonder why. Just your thoughts on uh, where we've come along those issues and where we need to go. You know, I think I think that some of this is about um, the. I think I think a number of things. So I'm going to try to <laughs> be brief. But um, one thing is, if we think about our life pre-pandemic, one of the benefits of living in a very diverse city is that you have to interact, even if it is just on a very transactional, casual level, with people who are not necessarily like you. There's very few places in Houston, and I think they are really class related, where you get into a space where it's there's only one kind of identity that is shared. And the value of that is that when we have casual transactional interactions with people, we build up an understand, we retain an understanding that the whole world is not filled with people that look like us, think like us, are like us. Um, the pandemic in many ways kind of has exacerbated, I think, our in-group um, sense of belonging and our sense of fear of others because literally connection became something that was dangerous for us. Um, that, in addition to social media, has created bubbles of thought where really are just echo chambers of our own belief. And so I think we're kind of in this perfect storm of those things happening that have really codified a lot of what people believe. I also think we can't escape the history of the United States. You know, hate in many ways was part of our, it was legal. Um, it was part of our legal infrastructure for decades and centuries. And so that history is often unknown 
And so we, we kind of are uploaded with this information in very subtle and subconscious ways and move through the world without really being cognizant of the fact that we've been influenced without even stopping to, to make a choice, whether it be by our family, by our schooling, um, by the circumstances of the communities that we've been in. The other piece to that I think that is really important as to the question why is that I think there's a degree of zooming out that we have to do when we when we think about hate often we think from a very personal level and the victimization of an individual of course feels very personal it is it's difficult um, to move from the morality or the lack of morality in that circumstance. But I, when I think of, of crime in general, when I think of hate, when I think of ism, othering, all of those things, they're really a matter of public safety and civic engagement, right? So, so the more we don't know each other, the more we don't engage with one another, the more fragile our connective tissue as a community is, and the more likely we are to see violence, to see crime, um, and to see that kind of spread. And so as we emerge-ish out of the pandemic as we move forward, I think we have a real powerful opportunity to recognize that, you know, standing up for what we believe and building courage and capacity within individuals to stand up for what they believe allows us to be a safer community, allows us to be a more prosperous community. The diversity of thought of people of community is not um, just a good thing because it makes us feel good. It's actually beneficial economically and strategically for a city. And so I think we've got to mature the conversation in a way that we begin to talk about economics. We begin to talk about public safety. We begin to talk about civic engagement and, and somewhat related, somewhat not. Larry, as you were saying earlier, you know, when, when a group is victimized, it's like, it's my group, not your group, right? I think what we're seeing emerge right now and what I hope to see happens is that as we see a rise to a particular group, whether it be Jewish people, whether it be Asian people, that these are opportunities to align with other groups that have also been victimized and not, not just with other groups that have been victimized, but these are opportunities for folks who have never been victims to stand up and say, I don't wanna live in a world where this is allowed. And that, you know, part of what I'm hoping really emerges from this research is that we find ways as, a, as the Houston community to respond with intolerance to hate, right? That we, that we will not tolerate it. It won't be okay. It won't be allowed to be because I think that keeps our law enforcement officers safe. I think that keeps Houstonian safe. And I think it demonstrates to those that would be inclined to perpetrate these crimes that this is not a city where we'll tolerate that. But that really involves unity, which is challenged because of kind of the reality of the pandemic that we're in right now and the separation that is healthy for us in one way, <laughs> biologically, but but unhealthy for us psychologically. So I think that, you know, the initiatives of particularly Coalition Against Hate, other coalitions around town. And I think the outreach that law enforcement does and attempts to do and attempts to engage with community, I think all of those things are important in demonstrating that we are not a community that wants to be known for hate crimes. We are not a place where we want to be known for um, not getting along. And I think that the events of the last couple of years have elevated at least into people's consciousness the reality that those breakdowns do exist in our society. And so the big question for us now is what do we do next? Okay, that's a good segue into what do we do next? <laughs> um, but you hit on a couple of key points as, and, uh, and uh, MJ also touched on it. If our country's racist past is connected to its racist present, and white supremacy is really the issue behind the issue. And power is really the upfront question and issue going forward. It seems that we see examples every day of as long as persons of color and women serve the needs of white supremacy and power, they're deemed okay, we leave them alone, we let them, you give them a pass. I, I'm using this next example because I think it's so glaringly for me points that out. The staff member of attorney general's office here in Texas 
who made the vile comment about Simone Biles having to pull out of the Olympics because of her health issues, her mental health issues. As long as she was the darling representing the United States of America about to win gold for our country, she was the loved person on the planet, the most, one of the most loved persons on the planet. As soon as she stopped serving the need or the reality of what that larger picture looks like, there was an opportunity to demonize her. That happens all the time in this country with persons of color and women. As, as long as we're serving the way they think we should be serving, we're okay. As soon as you step across any line, across any line, you become the enemy again. You always was the enemy. It was a fake kind of thing to get you past that point. Mm -hmm. So the real question of this, in this polarized society and charge era that we're living in, if not the ability to get back to the moral ethical questions involved in what we're talking about this evening, we seem to be on a pathway of the other destruction. Democracy even is in question. The Republic is at stake. So how do we begin to navigate to the larger picture? Uh, it's kind of like this, the question behind the question. Uh, it's kind of like those old, I think all of us are old enough to remember Paul Harvey. Now for the rest of the story. Mm -hmm. It's why we're fighting uh, having the racial discussions in schools. It's why we're fighting voter suppression. It's why we're doing all of those things to not allow the truth to come out. And as long as we're in this veiled untruth reality, it doesn't seem we're gonna move this bar anywhere along the way. Yeah, no, I agree. I think um, the issue, this issue of critical race theory and teaching our history in schools is um, appalling because you know, I am a woman in my 40s and constantly still learning new things and discovering truths. It's really uh, unacceptable to think that, look, if we don't know from where we have come from and what our history is, there really is no sure way to move forward. Um, and so, for me, education and information is super important. And I also think that focusing, I'm not very focused on the supremacists. I am focused in my work, I am focused on the good people who stay silent. The good people who go to church, go to mosque, go to synagogue, um, who have a good heart, but stay silent. So I am really about information, sharing information, educating, breaking bread, and building those connections. And I have to say the pandemic, everything that Abba shared earlier, it has felt like a setback because I felt like we were we were so tight, you know, especially for our coalition members, like getting to this place of camaraderie, of friendship, of collaboration, and everything is paused and moved to Zoom. And now we're looking at these variants. I will say though, I'm hopeful because I feel what we saw with Floyd and all the protests. Um, across the world was a lot of those who were silent have finally decided no more. And a lot of people who had parents who grew up with parents who were silent, um, they are choosing not to be silent. And so a shift is happening and I am feeling that energy and hoping that this is an opportunity, right? This is an opportunity and it gets you know, sometimes it, it may get worse before it gets better, but it's like you're at that precipice where it is so uncomfortable that something is got to give, something has got to give. Um, 
And we're all very smart people here on this panel and we really don't have an answer, right? We're trying to figure it out together. And I think it's important that we continue to, to have conversations like this and to connect and to figure this out together. So is silence based on fear and retribution? Uh, when Marjorie was talking about the, the number of hate crimes that go unreported, uh, and I'm not really able to actually capture a lot of that data because people do not come forward. Uh, Marjorie, when, when you talk, when the FBI and other law enforcement engage with those who want to come forward and tell their story and share their story, uh, what, do you, what do you see or hear? Is there a thread or a, a, a trend line uh, as they present that allows them to come forward and perhaps not others to come forward? Have you seen any correlation there? Um, not sure of, of correlation, but definitely patterns of, of people who are, yeah. are not comfortable, um, not comfortable reporting uh, what they've experienced. And, um, and so, you know, in order to try and address that, uh, you know, certainly in, in reporting, to the FBI, they can do that anonymously uh, if they you know, feel that, that they want to do it. It's certainly very important that, that we receive their reporting in some way, either by working with their, mm -hmm. their local law enforcement, uh, state or community-based organizations, wherever they're comfortable reporting. Um, you know, again, they can do so anonymously uh, through the FBI tip lines, uh, or uh, you know, we're calling 1-800-CALL-FBI you know, uh, or through the website. And so you know, we're very interested in, and very encouraging in receiving uh, their, their reports. Mm -hmm. Good, thank you. It is about see something, say something. I mean, the murder rate in Houston continues. Uh, the Houston Police Department says we need all community members to be the eyes and ears. When okay. you see something to speak up, to give us a call. We have now an online uh, database where you can report an officer. You can give a lodge a complaint against the officer. You can also mention the officers that have done great work and are doing great work. So mm -hmm. it's both that you need to start making sure we, we capture. So let's talk about the bigger context, which we have kind of set this in this evening. And each of you have touched on it in your own way. Do we really want to know the truth? I'm, all, I'm reminded lately of that line from the movie, and I can't remember which movie it is. You don't, you don't want to know the truth. You can't handle the truth. Have we done such a disservice to human beings by pushing down the issue of racism, by not talking about racism all these years, not admitting to our racist past, not admitting to the carryover from slavery to racism, to Jim Crow, to all the things that leads us to where we are today. That, that line is a straight line as to what we're experiencing today. And is it, is it such a fear to allow the truth to come out and then have, as MJ and others have said through a wonderful group like Coalition Against Hate and others, to have a safe, crucible, structured conversation, dialogue about these issues with a diverse in every way possible people in the room and try to move the needle forward as Abba said, so that Houston can become the model, the shining city on the hill, the model to the rest of the country. What holds us back from doing that? We got smart people in this city, all around this city. What's, what keeps us from? I think, I think part of what keeps us is that there's no way to have this conversation without it feeling personal. Right. You can have an academic conversation about race, opportunity, equity, inclusion, all of those things, even hate crime. But at the end of the day, it feels horrible to have to know that you participate in a structure that does not treat people fairly. It feels horrible to know that you are viewed differently and worse than others. And so I think this is just such a human space. And I want to I want to point back to two things that Marjorie that MJ brought up. One related to history. I think that 
I share um, very much a similar kind of philosophy about really reaching out to those who don't speak up, but also that history, you know, when we think about learning history, there's all this fear about learning about the bad things from the past. And there's no acknowledgement of the enormous unifying initiatives that have transformed this nation into its position in the world, like the abolitionist movement in, uh, that led to emancipation, like the civil rights movement. Those were tremendous demonstrations of unity amongst groups, between groups. Um, to move our society forward. So I think that that's a really important component when we think about history that we don't really acknowledge. And how do how will children know that they can work together to change the world that they live in unless they see demonstrations of that, which American history is, is rich with? Um, the other thing is, you know, um, I don't know that we are there is an element of just structural power and control, I think, that gets challenged by even conversations like this, right? Change is disruptive in nature, and we have had a lot of disruption over the last two years. But personally, I think this is a huge opportunity because we have individually and collectively had to adapt to a very vastly changing world. And there's got to be there's got to be um, wisdom that we can mine from this moment that really helps us be able to apply that to things like racism, to bias, to um, complex issues that are really kind of ruling the day right now. So I think that, you know, we've had a very unique collective experience during this pandemic that I think demonstrates to us that we're more flexible than we thought. Um, we are smarter than we thought, and that we we can work together. And I think to MJ's point about, and even to Marjorie's point about the resistance to report and just the the reluctance to to um, speak up and be and silence feels more comfortable. I think the more we create spaces where it it's it's I don't call them safe spaces in my classroom. I call them brave spaces. I think that the more that we encourage bravery and uplift that bravery, the more we may see a departure from the old ways of thinking, old ways of doing, and, and a, a welcoming of some new ways. And I work with a lot of organizations that are trying to change, and it's very uncomfortable, and it's difficult, and it, 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 you rely on navigating communication in different ways, but it is possible. It is possible. It's happening. And I, I wish that um, uplifting the stories of people that are making difference, organizations that are making change was more of what we saw. Because I think at the end of the day, and I, I could be naive in this thinking, but I think there are many more of us that are somewhere in the middle that really just want a safe place to live, good schools for our kids, food on the table, and, and security in our lives. And I think that fundamentally is the goal. And so getting through some of the things that we've been trained to hate each other about um, potentially liberates us into a whole new way of thinking and being. So I'm hopeful that we're, that we're not afraid um, and that we, we do move into that space. Mm -hmm. So if we're in the middle, and I refer to the middle as this in-between time, if we're in this in-between time, how do we then perhaps develop programs that speak to, as you just said very clearly, Abba, the ability to come together in a brave perspective uh, rather than a safe perspective and realize that what we're asking European American Caucasian white people to do is no different than African Americans, let me go back, than colored Negro black African Americans have had to do all their life. We have had to live with race, discuss race, understand race, be treated by race every single day of our lives. And as someone said the other day, why should the white community be given a pass? Mm -hmm. So here's the point, I think. It's not personal. It's not attacking. It's not blaming. It's not pointing fingers. It's just talking about reality. And it's sharing our experiences in breaking bread together and sharing our experiences. I always say our daily lived experiential realities that are just different. 
from each other, not better than, not more than, not less. And do it in a way that you understand where I'm coming from as a human being, not an individual, not a person. The essence of human being from my moral ethical value as a human being, as I want to represent yours and embrace yours. Mm -hmm. That's the kind of thing, conversation we have to have. And once we establish that relationship built on mutual trust and respect, we can go deeper and say, now let's talk about our history together. And let's talk about our past. Let's talk about how our past influenced the present. Let's talk about the greater future we can have together going forward. And as Abba said very clear, if housed in a historical context of talking about all the great things that have happened through history, our heroes, our sheroes, the movements, about the walking, talking now generations, but help people understand about legacy. It's about those yet waiting to be born. Mm -hmm. Why we're creating a better society, a better world is for those yet waiting to come after us. Mm -hmm. But it's not gonna happen if we can't have that honest conversation. It's, and you know, call it, call it uh, tough love, call it uh, uh, holy guilt, call it whatever you wanna call it, but do it because it has to be done. We're not gonna ever move the bar forward until we can have that, those conversations. And I see that played out as you do every day around this city. Mm. We want to touch on the corners. We want to tangentially talk about it. We want yeah. to kind of do but we don't want to have an in-depth conversation. And DE&I is not the way to get out of this conversation. No, it's not. It, it, it <laughs> no. is. That's a, false, that's a false mirror right now. And everybody's embracing it and jumping on the bandwagon. That's not going to get us where we need to go as a society. Because your employees are still human beings who are still experiencing the things that DEI can't even touch. All the training in the world is not going to get That's you there. Right. That's right. So, so where do we go? Well, I think, Larry, I, I just want to touch on something that you said and share a story that I think will uplift this particular moment. So Good. <laughs> um, one, one, one thing that I, that I want to say is that I think we have to make it okay for people to make mistakes. There is a major intimidation, particularly for white people to enter into this conversation, especially when those of us that have had these conversations all of our lives are well-versed in the topic, mm -hmm. um, whether by lived or learned experience. And so we're inviting folks in who have literally been sanctioned never to talk of this, that it was rude to talk of this, right? Mm -hmm. So the story I wanna tell, and I'll keep it brief, um, I've had the privilege of doing a lot of work with the Houston Police Department. And one of the things that we did was revise the way that cadets learn about race and, and engaging with communities. And I was, running through the new presentation, which was very different than anything that HPD had done before, um, but, but really pedagogically, I think, addressed this particular issue in a better way. And there was a trainer that came up to me after the, my, pre my training, and he, and he was a white man, and he said, what you are asking me to do is to jump in the ocean, and I don't know how to swim. And he said, I don't know how to do this. And I said, what you do is you start with what you just said, because you give permission for every other person in the room and every cadet sitting there to know they don't have to have the right answer. They don't have to say all the right things, but that they, they are free to participate even if they're going to make mistakes. And that particular officer is a champion for this particular segment of the training and has, and I have watched him share his story. And, and most recently he told me that um, after this part of the cadet curriculum, the, the peace officer curriculum cadets go through, he has seen greater camaraderie amongst the cadet class. He has seen them work together better, um, have more honest conversations. And so I think it's not just inviting all of us to the table, but it's 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 okay for us to say the table's going to be a little bit of a mess. We're going <laughs> to screw up. Yeah, and it's okay because if we think we, we are going it is to, okay. Yeah. yeah, if we think we're going to resolve something that's horribly uncomfortable, to put it lightly, in a comfortable way, then we're fooling ourselves. And I think oh, yeah. I hope that that story <laughs> uplifts what's possible. And um, you know, and I and I think that demonstrates the commitment that a lot of people have to moving things forward. 
-hmm. Well, I, I'm sure glad, I'm glad you shared that example. It gives me a chance to uh, give you a great compliment. I've set in on that course at the police academy. Mm -hmm. uh, it is a wonderful course. It is a course that they should have had years ago, but like they say, okay, we, we have it now. And that's all, that's what counts going forward. Mm -hmm. It is the first time that the Houston Police Department admitted in history. It's history. First time they admitted Joe Campus Torres in the reality oh, yes. of what happened. It's the first time they talked about every racial incident uh, yep. throughout the department over the years. And it's done in such a way that in, uh, uplifts and informs and educates you to the reality, as you said, that we all have those things in our background. It's just the way policing has, so an organization formed out of slave catching and of runaway slaves or, or freed slaves cannot but be Policing started to do that. That's what it was formed as the original marshals. Mm -hmm. So it can't help but have that that kind of connection to history. But I want to thank you. It's a great course. It really well, I, I and it was the the most remarkable thing to me about that course is that it was co-created with dozens of officers. Yes of yeah. different rank di across the organization and they really drove the content. And so I just, again, I think that those are the kinds of things that I hope get uplifted in a way that it demonstrates there are so many good people striving very hard to solve this complex issue um, that we see, you know, and, I, and I'm, I'm not, I know that there's, I know that reform is necessary but I think remembering that we are all human beings and that that um, throwing mandates at people doesn't change behavior. It no. just doesn't change behavior. And we have to work with, we have to engage with, we have to be in conversation with. And I think that going back to the research that that's what this is going to show, that's likely what this is gonna show us emerge is that we have to work with each other if we're gonna figure this thing out, so. Absolutely. I mean, one of our coalition um, principles is grace and allowing uh, each other grace within our meetings and our trainings and our workshops. And I think something you touched upon, Abba, was also vulnerability. I mean, at the end of the day, that is really what allows people to see the humanness, the humanity in one another is when we are vulnerable and when we realize that we've gone through similar experiences and upbringings. I mean, the coalition had the privilege of working with law enforcement the first year that we were on. And we did a workshop with street poets. Uh, they did gang intervention and violence prevention in Los Angeles. And we had ex gang bangers who have turned their life around through music and poetry mm -hmm. come run a workshop and we had writing circles and the the officers who showed up were forced to be there and so that in itself had its own dynamic but once we were done with the day everyone most everyone was happy to have been there and so many people opened up had worked together for 20 and 30 years and didn't know certain things about the other person, but because mm -hmm. they were able to be vulnerable through the arts, um, you know, allowing the facilitation of opening up and allowing people to share, we all got closer together. I mean, the ex gangbangers went out to lunch with the officers when we had our break and, and it was just beautiful. And so I believe that when we create these brave, courageous, uncomfortable spaces and we're willing to step into them, that, that majorly beautiful things will happen. Wonderful. Ladies, we're almost at the end of our time together this evening. So let me give each one of you about a good 30 seconds or so. Uh, any wrap up or closing comments that you would like to make, please do so. Okay, I'll go. Um, we have our annual event coming up October 7th, October 8th, and October 9th. October 7th, we're going to have a keynote with Adrian Marie Brown that will be open to the public and virtual. Um, October 8th, we will have a theatrical presentation called Matriarch, and that will be dealing with uh, 
women's issues and we will have a panel conversation with the director producer some of the actors and some local cbo's from the coalition that serve women and on that saturday we will have a children's offering i recently collaborated with houston grand opera and we've done a workshop on empathy and belonging uh, using the poetry of langston hughes and the compositions of margaret bonds and did that with uh, soprano Shabrell Williams. So we'll be sharing that with young children on Saturday. So I encourage everyone to go to our website and join our email list and follow us on social media platforms so that you don't miss out on those opportunities. And thank you, Larry, for having us. Thank you, MJ. Mm -hmm. Who else? My, my last two cents are going to be we don't have to wait for elected officials or structures of power to tell us we can be better to each other. We don't have to wait until the systems are perfect. We can start that right now. So that's that's my uh, my parting word. And, uh, you know, we'll continue to do the work as long as I can. And thank, thank you so you. much for having thank me. You, thank you, MJ. Uh, Marjorie? Thank you so much for the opportunity to be here tonight. I've learned so much from uh, the other panelists in, in the discussion. And um, I would uh, uh, direct anyone who's interested in learning more about what the FBI is doing regarding hate crimes, civil rights, and all related matters, fbi.gov. Also, FBI Houston is on Twitter, uh, and you can follow us there uh, for the latest on um, on our activities in this, re in this topic area. So thank you again. Well, I can't thank you all enough uh, for being with us this evening. I want to thank MJ and Abba and uh, Marjorie for being with us and doing this. Uh, closing thoughts of the, are this for me. Let's keep this moral ethical dialogue going. Let's keep this conversation and discussion alive in your circles, in your fears of influence, in the people who you love and who love you, who already have established trust with each other, and in those who you do not know, establish a relationship so you can build that trust. Because mutual trust and respect is the key to all of this work. Nothing happens without trust. Nothing happens without trust. So as we share going forward our different viewpoints on diversity, our compelling ideas and perspectives on where we go to collectively as human beings in the future of Houston, how we exposed, be exposed more to different realities and different ideas as we have free exchange of these ideas and challenge and question them in the right way. How we talk about more civil discourse that is needed, the reality of more transparency, and transparency, accountability and being held to those accountability. It is important that we do this work. Uh, this is important work. This is in so many ways sacred work. Because the future of democracy really hangs on this work. In an increasingly majority minority society, it is these kinds of conversations and dialogue that will move the bar, the bar further along than almost anything else we can do at this time in history. Because if not, we see all the signs of stepping back rather than moving forward, going backwards rather than moving ahead. So as we create this common bond together to create the kind of Houston, kind of Texas, the kind of America we want, Let's do it with all the intentionality and mindfulness that we can muster because it is truly the cause of the times of this hour that we're in now. So on behalf of Dr. Lawson, the director of the Houston Public Library, Dr. Rhea Lawson, our wonderful staff here at the Houston Public Library, I wanna thank you for joining us on this day. And until we come together again, be well, be safe, and in a democracy, in a democratic society, learn to practice civility and do it with peace and power and love. We'll see you next time.